take your seats. I'm glad you could find your way to the classroom today. My apologies as the head of personnel had to scramble to put this shitbox together, but for our purposes it will work just fine. We should be fine assuming the station doesn't explode, which it almost certainly doesn't with terrifying regularity. Anyways, let me log in with my ID here and... We'll just ignore that for now. Eyes up front and please ignore the noise. So initially this lecture was going to be relatively brief as I had originally wanted to talk about every inner sphere mech warrior's worst nightmare. These assholes from beyond the deep periphery and their attempts to party crash the inner sphere one battle at a time. This lecture was originally focused on Clanner Elementals only, their power armor, battle history, and then afterwards to let you guys decide whether they were either first-rate murder hobo shock troops or merely convenient footballs for your assault lance. We even had a good tagline for this initial production. But that was before I read my mountain of messages, my backlog of emails, and the numerous other inquiries I had received. You see... I had made what we call in the education business a fucking boo-boo. I'd put the spotlight of historical inquiry onto a big subject, and as a result people had a multitude of follow-up questions. Which I suppose is my own damn fault, after all I'd followed up a major history lecture two-parter with a relatively brief history on a middling if borderline generic General Motors product. Through communication during office hours, I became distinctly aware that my audience wanted to know what in the hell became of the SLDF in the years and decades after the conclusion of the Ameris Civil War, and how they had fared in the deep periphery on their exodus from the inner sphere. The main question was this, how in the hell did the battle-scarred survivors of the legendary SLDF slowly turn into, well, these guys? Having heard your questions and acknowledging fully I left a great many threads hanging, I adjusted the scope of today's lecture accordingly. Today we are going to discuss the eventual fate of General Alexander Kerensky, his family and the remnants of the SLDF who followed him into the unknown. We're going to talk about how, out there in the deepest reaches of the periphery, they forged their own destiny, and how the needs of survival changed them, and well, how they eventually decided to return to the inner sphere to right past wrongs. So, that being said, welcome to the lecture on Exodus to Elementals, a relatively brief primer on the clans. Brief by my definition anyways, then again I suppose my tenure does allow me to say whatever the fuck I want. I must offer my sincerest apologies ahead of time for those who will want me to cover everything in fine detail as the scope of this lecture only allows for me to hit the main points and at times only briefly so. I assure you, many of these subjects will be covered in far greater detail as time and interest allows through future lectures. This lesson itself is intended to serve as a primer for understanding the clans and their ways. I apologize as well to those kept waiting for the development of this lecture, as I had taken a mandated sabbatical from these projects for my own well-being. So, without further ado, fill your glass and dim the light, and we shall begin. To frame the history of what would eventually become the clans, we will need to go back and cover several key events which directly influenced General Alexander Kerensky's eventual exodus. I strongly feel that every step taken toward and later on the exodus road plays a part in everything that follows. To accomplish this, we must wind the clock back to February of 2784, and as we had established near the end of the Ameris Civil War lecture series, it was a dark time, full of uncertainty and fear. These were the final days of Star League. By February of 2784, the Ameris Civil War was finally over, and Ameris had been dead for nearly five years, but the scars of his madness had still not healed. The successor states of the Inner Sphere were again at odds, turning their industries toward war, with the devastated hegemony and many other former Star League territories soon going to whoever laid claim to them first. 
The SLDF at this point was a bare remnant of its once former glory, and any notion of the pre-war Leviathan Forest was now consigned to a fate unknown. They had campaigned long and hard to rid the inner sphere of perhaps the worst tyrant yet seen, and through sheer determination and heroic sacrifice, they had achieved that aim at enormous cost. But peace would not last. The war had established a dangerous precedent for the history of the Inner Sphere, in that Ameris' actions had not only killed Richard Cameron, but the very notion of Star League. A usurper had cut the head off of not only a dynasty, but an ideology. Ameris had proved that a House Lord could, with sufficient preparation, resources, and guile, establish primacy over the Inner Sphere with a single master stroke of diabolical genius. Star League was at this point reduced to the bare remnants of the damage to Gemini, the SLDF, and whatever the House Lords had not claimed for themselves immediately following Ameris' demise. Without the stabilizing presence of the First Lord and the hegemony's power at the heart of the Inner Sphere much reduced in the wake of the conflict, a dangerous power vacuum had emerged. With no First Lord or Royal Dynasty to lead the government, the situation seemed increasingly hopeless. The functional head of the Star League government had been vacated, after all, in this case literally, and no agreed-upon means of how to restore the government post-war had yet been implemented. There was, after all, no known contingency plan for a scenario this unthinkable. The Cameron Dynasty was, for all intents and purposes, removed from the Inner Sphere, and all they had stood for was, at most for now, a distant memory and a dead dream. That's not to say the powers to be hadn't tried to fix things, for immediately after the Ameris Civil War, the Star League High Council had met to settle outstanding affairs of state and appoint a new First Lord. But through mutual distrust and endless debate on who would inherit the mantle of leadership, they had been unable to reach a lasting decision. And so the great lords of the Inner Sphere, after having been completely unable to agree on the actual issue of succession, pulled away from the negotiations and acted in unison to dissolve the Star League High Council in October of 2780. That is, after stripping General Alexander Kerensky of his titles and authority. For that issue was one of the few major things they had completely agreed upon that the good general was no longer needed to wear the title of protector. The great lords of the Inner Sphere were in part terrified that the general would, through his legendary leadership and command of the SLDF, take control of Star League if he were to remain in any position of significant authority. There were also very real concerns that even if they had agreed to appoint a new First Lord, Alexander Kerensky would shape the future for any political dynasty as he had tried to do with the Camerons. The fact that Alexander Kerensky had brought Ameris to justice was lost on them. The fact that Kerensky had seen the evil in Ameris and acted upon it, that he had tirelessly crusaded to save the Star League from its greatest threat, that he had refused to back down, to give ground or give up through many hellacious campaigns were all irrelevant considerations from the perspective of the High Council. To them, he was just a general. And to them, generals were easily replaced. But as history would have it, General Alexander Kerensky had other plans. After they dismissed Kerensky and his grand notions of rebuilding Star League, they made one more fateful decision. The great house lords of the Inner Sphere agreed that Jerome Blake would be appointed to the position of Star League Minister of Communications in order to rebuild the Star League's shattered communications network that they all relied upon. The Great Houses all needed the HPG network which had been nearly destroyed during the war and couldn't trust anyone other than a dedicated neutral party to oversee it. This decision would have far-reaching consequences of its own, but I will get to that lesson in time. And after those few decisions on which they could reach consensus, they summarily dissolved the High Council, telling the Inner Sphere via broadcast that future compromise was impossible on the issue of succession. With that done, they then left for their own holdings to prepare for the power struggles to come. 
to the High Lords, Star League was now dead and buried, and the future of their houses was now firmly in their own hands. Privately, the Great Lords had decided for themselves that each of them was the rightful inheritor of Star League, being that there can be only one First Lord, the solution to this disagreement would in time be solved in the standard manner common to the Inner Sphere. Total war. Their inability to give ground, to find commonality in these dire times, and their greed and avarice had set the stage for generations of inter-house conflict and served as the direct catalyst to the four great succession wars which would follow. But despite being dismissed from his role as protector, General Kerensky still hadn't given up hope. For years, he would exhaustively try and fail to reconvene the great lords, spending his time shuttling between the various factions, meeting with them individually in order to bring them together once more, to find any common ground for negotiation and perhaps restart the spark of Star League. He tried to show them that as a people united once more under a single cause, they could potentially provide a new, wonderful age of progress and plenty to their people. Or at the very least, they could recover from the generation of war the Inner Sphere had just crawled out of. Minimally, Kerensky was trying to at least prevent the slow slide into war he felt was coming. Perhaps Kerensky wanted to feel that all he and his men had sacrificed for was not in vain but his pleas fell on deaf ears. Inner Sphere nobles being what they are, one by one they had opted to ignore the great general, and when he had finally exhausted every last option for a lasting diplomatic solution, Alexander Kerensky knew what he had to do. Keep in mind that he alone was still at this point provisionally in command of the single largest military the Inner Sphere had, and most of them were still willing to do whatever the hell the Great General said was necessary, even if it meant going to war once more. And that course of action had indeed been suggested. For General Aaron de Chevalier, Alexander Kerensky's right-hand man and trusted confidant had forwarded the thought that maybe the SLDF should solve the problems of the Inner Sphere by doing away with these petty nobles and their political aspirations once and for all. De Chevalier told Kerensky that the troops stood ready to follow him to the gates of hell if need be. The plan would have been, presumably, to use the full might of the SLDF to swiftly neutralize the fighting strength of the Great Houses to keep peace in the interim, and then restart Star League from the ground up without the issue of shit-tier nobility ruining everything. And to that proposal, being offered the opportunity to use the SLDF against the Inner Sphere to provisionally save it, to take charge and hold power over the entire Inner Sphere as a guiding hand, Kerensky had said no. I think it shows extraordinary character and mindfulness that after all he'd suffered, he was unwilling to become a tyrant to fix the situation. After all, to replace a tyrant with a tyrant would only serve as a terrible precedent for future generations. And so, on 14th February 2784, General Kerensky briefed the assembled officer corps of the SLDF in an empty warehouse on Terra. It was, by design, a secret meeting and wisely so for what the general proposed would be seen as nothing short of treasonous against the Star League government. That is, if you could still consider Star League an actual government at that point. All of his other options exhausted or unthinkable, he fully intended to take the SLDF beyond the reach of any of the great houses and their territorial aspirations. He wanted to spare the men and women of the SLDF from having to play a part in the next great war, to spare the citizens of the inner sphere from the ruinous firepower of the Star League Defense Force, and perhaps in the process, force the great lords of the inner sphere to rethink what they were planning on doing. General Alexander Kerensky felt it was his solemn duty and the duty of his officers to take the SLDF completely out of the equation. And while many felt the Exodus plan as presented was the most ethical, moral, and dutiful choice remaining to them at this point in time, some officers felt their duty was to stay and defend at least a portion of what they'd fought so long for. There was no dispute that the time to decide was now upon them for the coming storm was obvious to those officers present at this final meeting of the assembled SLDF. 
The great houses had already made private and public overtures to recruit from their forces to bolster growing house armies. To his credit, General Alexander Kerensky allowed the soldiers of the SLDF to make up their own choices regarding their future, for he could not in good faith force them to obey. After all they had suffered, and the high cost of their victory over Amaris, he felt it best for each officer and each soldier to choose for themselves what course they would follow. And the choices at this point were rather grim. Either stay in the increasingly unstable inner sphere to make a future among the ruins, waiting for the war or wars to come, or commit to the exodus and hope for the best. And when the votes were finally tallied, fully 80% of the assembled forces opted to follow Kerensky's plan and leave. For those opting to join the exodus operation, the choice to follow the general was perceived as wiser in throwing their future plans in with any of the great houses. After all, they joined the SLDF to serve Star League as a whole, not the territorial ambitions of any particular house. Even if Star League was now a mere idea supported by the crumbling infrastructure of the mauled hegemony, much of the SLDF felt that continuing to serve its ideology was a far better option and potentially a more noble choice than serving as cannon fodder in the wars to come. It is also worth noting the cost of the Amaris Civil War. The men and women of the SLDF carried it with them. The war had made an indelible mark upon them all. War has a cruel way of stripping the civilization from a soldier, and piece by piece many of them were reduced to feeling they had nothing left but the uniform they wore. Returning to civilization for many was an unwelcome culture shock. The greatest casualty of the Amer Civil War inflicted on the SLDF was perhaps being ultimately reminded of the civilized versions of their past selves. Staying in uniform provided them with a necessary sense of identity and belonging that they desperately needed after all they'd suffered, as many of them now knew no home but the SLDF, no family but their fellow comrades in arms, their brother or sister in uniform. It is no wonder that many saw the Exodus as the best option they had. Most of them had nothing left to lose at this point, but not all would choose to see it this way. Some would refuse to leave and opt to stay in the inner sphere on their own terms. Of the SLDF 12th Corps, the 151st Royal Battle Mech Division, the infamous Ulysses S. Grant Division itself had opted to stay under the outspoken commander Lauren Hayes, who was, from the very start, a hard critic to the idea of picking up and leaving. And Major General Lauren Hayes had her reasons. She possessed extraordinary conviction in her beliefs. She was a Star League Major General and had assumed division command after seeing her commanding officer cut down in the brutal Canopus campaign. During the conflict she led from the front in a battle master, taking to the field through Operations Chieftain and the final liberation of Terra, seriously wounded in combat and losing a hand from a direct hit to the cockpit, she never gave up field command and was only fitted with a prosthetic once Amaris was dead and his empire a smoking crater. She was an idealist who saw abandoning their duties and to flee the increasingly unstable political situation as the death knell of the inner sphere and a betrayal of everything Star League stood for. Despite their differences of opinion, however, Kerensky saw in her a glimmer of promise and in her idealism a semblance of hope for any who opted to stay behind hoping in part to preserve a part of Star League in the inner sphere, a deal was brokered, a compromise of sorts between General Kerensky, General Hayes, and Jerome Blake. Those under her command who wanted to stay would join the last vestiges of the Star League government. Jerome Blake was the newly appointed and as history would have it final communications director of SL Comnet and he had immediate need of significant forces to defend his holdings. And so Alexander Kerensky bartered the loyalty of the 151st Royal Battle Mech Division to Jerome Blake to become the military arm of SL Comnet, soon to be Comstar who would in turn keep a small piece of Star League alive in the heart of the inner sphere if secretly. I believe the hope at this time was that if Blake's network could maintain communications and information flowing, the barest civility of Starley could potentially endure. 
Perhaps the promise of a brighter future could in time follow. However, with the value of the HBG network being what it is, Blake knew he would need a mailed fist to hammer at anyone seeking to impede the free flow of communications, data, and information. Further, this agreement between the SLDF and Comstar served another purpose. Blake could keep everything on the sly until the Exodus fleet had left, and then cover it up from there. I realize I did cover this briefly during the end of the Ameris Civil War lecture series, but the reason I bring this up again is that this small and mostly forgotten act, the seeding of what would become Comstar with vastly powerful forces, is something that lets us see into Kerensky's mindset. By setting up small parts of the Star League and the SLDFs to survive at the heart of the inner sphere, in secret, to protect the last vestiges of government speaks to me that he hoped that maybe, someday, perhaps in a better future, he or his forces may in some way return to restore the former glory of Star League. I believe it speaks to the merits of Kerensky's character that while extensive preparations were made to leave the crumbling inner sphere behind, he was also prepared for a way home when the time was right. He would tragically never live to see the end result of his romantic optimism, or how by giving Comstar elite military forces he would inadvertently be shaping the future in ways he could never fathom. The departure of the 151st Royal Battle Mac Division and those who sided with General Hayes was the first major fracturing of Kerensky's command. The second would come shortly thereafter. Some people decided to stay because they'd had their share of time in uniform and wanted a piece of the action for themselves. Realizing the economy of the inner sphere was gearing up for the mother of all wars, they opted to put their long honed battlefield skills on the open market. Several pieces of the SLDF knew full well that the Inner Sphere's chief product was war and that the Great Lords needed little, if any reason, to slug it out. And so these people realized that their unique skill sets hard won on the battlefield could provisionally make them exceptionally wealthy. Numerous mercenary units formed from the various combat commands of the SLDF who had opted to not partake in the Exodus, among them the infamous Eridani Light Horse, the 4th Tau Seti Rangers, and the Screaming Eagles. Many of these units and others would serve with the utmost distinction until meeting the SLDF again. But I do promise to cover more of their ultimate fate in time. Of the monolithic Hobbesian Leviathan that was its pre-war strength, only 113 divisions of the SLDF remained post Ameris Civil War. And of those, over 100 divisions had opted to follow General Alexander Kerensky away from the coming conflagration. From available records, surviving from this time, I can say with some certainty, the breakdown is as follows. 32 battle mech divisions, 76 infantry divisions, and 63 independent regiments, combat commands, irregulars, and volunteers. This is a force of almost 6 million men and women, plus their equipment. One third of those personnel were regular frontline soldiers, with the rest now being their support staff, scientists, loyalist Star League bureaucrats, plus other remnants of the now dissolved Star League government. Once finally ready and assembled in their staging areas, the fleet itself was 1,392 jump ships, escorted by an armada of 402 warships. Between them, they had a total drop capacity of 5,000 first-rate drop ships. Even diminished as they were from pre-war strength, this fleet was the single largest concentration of force currently present in the inner sphere. Large as this force was, moving through the increasingly contested inner sphere took enormous care and would have been fundamentally impossible without the full compliance of what would become Comstar. Still, the great houses of the Inner Sphere understandably grew nervous when Kerensky's massive fleet arrived in system, and despite the persistent communications difficulties on the still damaged HPG network, the sporadic rumors of Kerensky's massive fleet moving through the Inner Sphere persisted. When signaled directly or asked what his intentions were, General Kerensky would respond the fleet was on extended maneuvers, an excuse most decided to believe, because they couldn't do a goddamn thing about it. On the 8th of July, the Exodus order was given, and the fleets jumped. They made their way through the territory of the Draconis Combine, headed straight for the periphery, 
Along the way, any SLDF holding, base, warehouse, or shipyard they encountered would strip completely of useful resources before moving on. From New Samarkand, the fleet assembled again, and Kerensky made a last choice before leaving the Inner Sphere forever. He followed the suggestion of one of his rank-and-file soldiers and donated the remains of Stefan Ameris to the New Samarkand Medical School. His corpse would serve as a training tool for aspiring doctors who wanted to see what the insides of a tyrant looked like. On November the 5th, the fleet began leaving the system. The last ship to jump out was Kerensky's own flagship, the McKenna's Pride, itself now an ancient relic of Star League. As far as Inner Sphere historical records allow, the fleet was last spotted over Gutara 5. Shortly thereafter, they faded into memory. That is to say, from Inner Sphere historical records, they ceased to exist for the most part, but some would always wonder where they had gone. The Great Houses, upon realizing that the excuse of extended maneuvers were in fact nothing of the sort, were furious Kerensky had left. But they now had their own problems. They were already in the planning stages for what would become the First Succession War. As such, they had more immediate concerns than the weapons, advanced technology, and warriors now outside their reach. And with that simple consideration, the Inner Sphere turned its gaze inward, with each successor state now eyeing the other as potential territorial acquisitions. As an ancient Terran philosopher has said, War is nothing more than a continuation of politics by other means. What would follow would certainly be that, and more. Soon enough, there would be a war, the likes of which no one had ever seen. And three more after that, to prove in my humble opinion one thing. In all likelihood, Alexander Kerensky was probably the last greatest hope the Inner Sphere ever had of a lasting if not permanent peace. And now that he had gone, it would soon begin to finally fall apart. But the story of the SLDF doesn't end there. The end of the SLDF starts where the map to civilization ends, the deep periphery. We're going to have to talk about the Exodus Road. Throughout history, there has always been the edge of the map, the frontier. That place where all knowledge of what may lay beyond being the providence of rumor, superstition, and fear. During the early age of sail on ancient Terra, mankind, not knowing what perils lay beyond the edge of the known world, would draw great beasts there and say, here be dragons. To cross into the unknown, and what lay beyond has always been the providence of the crazy or desperate or those without other options. And fate had made General Alexander Kerensky precisely that sort of man. And so, the enormous Exodus fleet made careful progress into unknown territory. The deep periphery was at best, partially charted space. Long ago, the Inner Sphere had stopped putting big money into programs of deep space exploration, instead opting to improve the holdings they had or fight over them. It is believed that General Alexander Kerensky only had a vague notion as to their eventual destination. Before departing in preparation, he downloaded the total sum of data from the defunct Star League Astrological Mapping Corps, copying every last chart and map file, and then destroyed the originals. He wanted to ensure none could follow them. But deep beyond the periphery was truly the unknown. And as such, any progress through this poorly charted and mostly unknown region of space came slowly as scouts had to find an optimal path for the fleet and then report back that it was truly safe. Alexander Kerensky was thorough in coordinating the massive fleet, driving scouts forward to find a path while directing warships and scouting jump ships to make up a substantial rear guard to ensure they weren't being tailed or followed. Random course corrections were routinely ordered to prevent any forces following their wake from guessing their final destination. Even garbage from the fleet was ejected jumps away from their actual course to prevent being tracked by what they left behind. If any vessel of this era ever did choose to try and follow the Exodus fleet, none ever reported back. But the Inner Sphere also had its hands full at this point. For General Kerensky's great concerns were sadly becoming prophetic. As a necessary side note, 
I must mention that the First Succession War, starting in 2786, utilized the full arsenals of the Great Houses and turned into a 34-year-long nightmare which claimed human lives by the billions. It is accordingly no great surprise that the forces of the Great Houses, while tremendously upset at the exodus of the SLDF, dedicated few if any resources in trying to follow them. They had their own fucking problems by the Megaton, but I guess that's what happens when you throw the rules of warfare out the window and decide to settle things with every weapon you've got. The total disregard for human life and reckless lack of constraint in the conduct of the First Succession War would result in the technological base of the Inner Sphere degrading significantly. Through their violent excess, they erased many centuries of progress and a few short decades of intense warfare. In the history of the Inner Sphere, violence was never the answer. Violence is a question, and the answer is inevitably yes. As the Inner Sphere began to slide into eventual war, the Exodus fleet had its own significant trouble. Despite careful preparation and well-trained crews, many ships were tragically lost through misjump or catastrophic drive failure. Time and again, vessels would wait at the jump point for ships that failed to ever materialize. One by one, the vessels of the Great Fleet were being whittled away by what amounted to error and malfunction. Many of the ships in the SLDF were by now ancient, battle-scarred vessels held together far beyond their design lifespan, with scavenged parts and jury rig repairs. As a noteworthy example, the McKenna Warship class, once the pride of the SLDF Navy, was well over 130 years old as a design, and after the hard operations tempo of the Ameris Civil War, multiple refits, and hasty wartime repairs, it was no wonder these vessels were beginning to show their age. Shortages in supplies and necessary materials resulted in stringent rationing and a universally low standard of living among the forces of the Exodus fleet, but morale was initially quite high. Most believed in General Alexander Kerensky enough to risk death for decades up to this point, so the perils of the unknown were just yet another challenge to overcome. However, as fate would have it, this road would be longer than they had ever expected, and after a few months of jumping into the unknown, and now, with the inner sphere far, far behind them, some began to express significant doubt. Tensions grew slowly at first between the crews, between the civilians and the military. Some began to consider that the inner sphere was far from perfect, but it was at least civilization, and out here was anything but. With every jump they pressed on, the SLDF began to crack from these stresses, as more and more of the fleet wondered if leaving everything behind was really the best choice they could have made. Some, in the quiet darkness of space and now with endless time to ponder the situation, wondered if they'd left for the wrong reasons, and so the seeds of doubt were planted deep in the fleet. Kerensky did what he could to hold them together, to remind them of their purpose. But, for many, this journey was becoming a lengthy nightmare. A nightmare spent in cramped ship corridors with no news from home, or where they were headed, as one by one ships around them disappeared due to accident. The discomfort of severely cramped living and working conditions, the relatively few amenities, strict rationing, and the feeling of coming to terms with the choice they had made was continually weighing on the minds of the Exodus fleet. Random course corrections ordered by Kerensky to deter pursuit, ships being detached to go dump garbage far away from the route they intended to take, and similar extensive measures in covering their tracks continued to ensure a very slow pace of progress. While these measures were incredibly successful in covering their tracks, as even Comstar's intelligence service would find years later, these very precautions to safeguard their journey would result in such a slow pace of progress as to further add to the general worry that the Exodus was a faltering exercise in futility, not a planned military operation. Many began to fear that they were merely floating around in the periphery until they all died, got lost, or starved. Some began to believe this was a trip to nowhere, a living purgatory spent between old bulkheads, worse company, and rapidly deteriorating morale. Alexander Kerensky did his best to lead people through the exodus, shuttling between ships at every jump, taking time to explain why it was a far better choice to leave than pound the great house lords of the inner sphere into submission. He took time to listen, to patiently hear their concerns, and showed extraordinary resolve in maintaining morale as best he could. But in the end, he was only one man, 
While Alexander Kerensky knew how difficult it was to hold people together through the uncertainty and chaos of a long war, he found it all that much harder to hold them together through peace, especially when all there is to do is wait and see what the next jump brings. This wasn't helped by the General Zone family fucking things up. At the start of the exodus, General Alexander Kerensky revealed he had a family. He'd been married for nearly two decades by the start of the exodus, but had kept that fact hidden save for a few trustworthy souls. The years leading up to the Amerith Civil War and the time following it had been chaotic. To protect his family from reprisal, he had kept their place in the inner sphere a necessary secret. His wife and his two sons had been in Moscow during the Ameris occupation, and their anonymity had most certainly assured their survival. Trapped on Terra during the war, Katyusha had bravely resisted Ameris' occupation, committed herself to sabotaging the regime at every chance she had while bitterly fighting for her family's survival. She was tough as nails, was nearly captured on a handful of occasions, and even shot twice. Throughout, she maintained a spirit of defiance and resolved, for her family's sake, to never give up. But while Alexander Kerensky's wife Katyusha was a bedrock of emotional and moral support, his sons were a colossal pain in his ass. I have, to this point, been largely unbiased. But when it comes to the general's sons, I can't guarantee to hold my tongue. They are responsible for their actions and everything that followed. You have been warned. In some history circles, it is often suggested that any competent ruler or leader will be eclipsed by the sheer incompetence, stupidity, or madness of their heirs or an offspring. Some historians have even chosen to mark this problem as an unavoidable progression of any dedicated ruling class, wherein a great unifying ruler will pass the reins onto the less capable and far less competent heirs, and so that in a few generations any dynasty will undermine its own foundation and result in total ruin. So I suppose this is where I introduce Nicholas and Andre Kerensky. Yes, I know in agreed upon sources it's put as Andere, but I'm not going to say that, because my brain will autocorrect it every time, and while I would like to label Nicholas and Andre as the goofus and gallant of the Kerensky lineage, the comparison would be tragically incorrect. Also, I think the clanners in the audience would batch on me the moment I stopped talking in order to claim me a bondsman in order to tell them bedtime stories until I perish. So in the interests of a temporary peace, I think I'd rather label them as what they were. Flawed men in the shadow of a truly great one. Nicholas Kerensky was the elder son of General Kerensky and of near zero historical significance at this point in his life. Not saying he was crap, but comparing him to his father is like comparing raisins to wine. Same ingredients, but far different outcomes. As a person, Nicholas Kerensky was known principally for being exceptionally manipulative, especially where his own legacy was later concerned. Clan records revere him as being a near saint, but he had a major hand in writing his own legacy. Further, I suspect that his creative historical revisionism was exercised to enhance his standing, associate his legacy with the great accomplishments of his father, all the while downplaying his many many faults. I feel that Nicholas Kerensky feared that history would realize he was nothing more than the troubled son of a great man, desperately trying to hold on to the significance of his legacy and through that ensure his own place in the spotlight. What I can say with any certainty is that he was only two when the Amer Civil War started and only 16 when it ended, so any reports of him having played a significant role in the conflict are probably horseshit. However, records of his deeds from this time period are hard to find, as those who survived the Ameris occupation of Terra seldom spoke of the atrocities they endured. I believe this made a mark on him he would carry his entire life. He was a brash and headstrong man with a propensity to try to get his own way regardless of the consequences. As far as I am able to find, he trended towards sociopathic behavior with deep-seated emotional issues no doubt stemming from the horrors of the Ameris Civil War. But more on that in a bit. Andrei Kerensky was Nicholas's brother and was the younger son of Katyusha and Alexander Kerensky. 
He was born on Terra, but spent most of his childhood trying to survive in the shadow of Maris's security forces. By his adolescent years, he was fighting alongside local resistance forces from their Moscow base. I believe that he was, above all, quite humble and content to play whatever role history assigned to him. He was also a bit naive and trusting in the extreme, especially where his fellow SLDF personnel were concerned, and doubly so for his family. And it was through this trust he was directly manipulated by his brother Nicholas into encouraging the dissidents in the fleet to act on their desperate dissatisfaction. Did I mention Nicholas Kerensky was a manipulative sociopath? And we know how that typically plays out, right? What is known for certain is that Nicholas Kerensky used his brother Andre to encourage those among the fleet who thought the exodus was a mistake into what would become an open mutiny. Why he did this is a bit harder to pin down, as the records of the event are probably revised by Nicholas himself and naturally paint this as the weakness of the men and women in question, not his own manipulation. Perhaps Nicholas felt it was time to take charge away from his aging father. Perhaps Nicholas felt it was now his destiny to lead the Exodus fleet to the Promised Land, as his father had led them through the war. Perhaps he was tired of not being the center of attention and wanted his moment in the sun to steer his own destiny for once. Perhaps Nicholas wanted to do away with these non-believers and call the fleet of the weak personnel lacking the necessary faith to proceed. I feel that Nicholas was fundamentally damaged and didn't know how trust worked. What is known is he pushed his younger brother into speaking with the disaffected officers and crews wanting to end the exodus. And as such, I feel it is entirely fair to put the responsibility of what followed on him. After 14 long months of slowly jumping deeper and deeper into unknown space and with devious manipulation on behalf of Nicholas Kerensky, morale collapsed to a breaking point. It was in August of 2785 that things came to a head. Many were now openly concerned that the great general had zero plans other than keeping the fleet moving forward at any cost, one jump at a time. By this time, through urging by Andre Kerensky on the orders and influence of his brother Nicholas, enough officers had decided mutiny was the best remaining course of action, and perhaps emboldened by the support of Alexander Kerensky's progeny, they acted. And the repercussions of the decision would prove remarkable. The Prince Eugen, a Texas-class battleship, openly broke from the fleet, announcing a plan to return to the inner sphere and whatever fate awaited them. They would not take a single jump further, nor would they obey any orders to return to the fleet. They were leaving on their own terms back to the inner sphere by the most direct course available. If this had been one of the multitude of scout vessels or light warships, none would have likely taken notice. This whole incident may have been chalked up to a misjump if they had chosen to simply disappear, but the Prince Eugen was a Texas-class battleship, one of 52 built pre-Ameris coup, and was now one of only seven in existence. It was a significant vessel to break from the fleet, and perhaps due to her imposing status in the order of battle, she was joined by a small flotilla who had no intention of continuing the the exodus any step further. In total, eight other vessels followed suit in open mutiny. This mutiny's leader was Admiral Votok, who conspired with General Wilbur Brasso of SLDF Ground Command, among many other notable officers. These weren't simply green men shaky at the notion of deep space, but long-standing veterans who'd finally lost faith in what they thought was now a doomed endeavor. Their crews threw in with them because they too had suffered long campaigns and didn't want to die lost in space to what was now to them a thoroughly lost cause. General Alexander Kerensky wasn't going to allow the fleet to fracture, and so he acted immediately to end this threat. Rather than rush into a fight, taking it ship versus ship and risking damage to vessels he could not replace or properly repair, or worse, risk civilians being massacred in the crossfire, Kerensky made a calculated choice. Kerensky called in the one group he knew could get the job done right. He called on what remained of the best of the best, the goddamn Black Watch. 
Kerensky called Major Elizabeth Hazen of the Black Watch to his side and gave her orders to bring the ships back into the fold, to stop the mutiny, and restore good order by bringing the mutineers to immediate military justice to face off against the entirety of a mutinous warship flotilla, to combat its crews, marines, and support staff, Hazen took only a force of 160 Black Watch marines. The crew of the Prince Eugen probably knew they screwed up the moment the drop pods hammered into its hull. Still, they had a distinct advantage in numerical superiority, years of training, and total familiarity with the vessels they'd operated through a long war. The Black Watch, however, had bad shit crazy on their side. By this point, the battle-hardened veterans of the Black Watch were people who'd seen enough nukes to find them frankly fucking boring. So a zero-G space battle boarding action was a walk in the fucking park. With zero fucks given, with no mercy on offer, the Black Watch boarded the Prince Oigan, kicked the doors in, and proceeded to ventilate all opposition. They hammered through the corridors like the fist of an angry god. In record time, the Black Watch secured the vessel with ruthless efficiency, scouring the corridors of any resistance. After a furious firefight, the Admiral in charge lay dead, and the ringleaders of the mutiny were captured relatively unharmed. The eight other ships surrendered without a fucking shot, surrendering outright, absolutely terrified of the Black Watch and General Kerensky's wrath. Major Elizabeth Hazen dragged the surviving mutineers to a military court-martial held at the jump point out of system. The sentence was brutal. After all was said and done, all excuses heard and all defenses noted, every single officer at or above the rank of captain were summarily executed. Major Hazen handed down the orders herself, and General Kerensky made his son Andre take part in the firing squad because of the key part he played in encouraging the dissenters. I feel that this was a tad unfair. As previously stated, Nicholas Kerensky had convinced Andre to speak with the mutineers before they had acted, in a ploy to effect changes on the exodus in order to perhaps steer it or take charge and play hero or prove to his father that he true was a great man. Nicholas Kerensky had then opted to stay in the shadows, content to watch things play out regardless of the consequences, and Andre could have told everyone of Nicholas's part, of Nicholas Kerensky's meddling and plotting and manipulation, but he kept silent and refused to say an ill word about his brother's doing and took his punishment like a man. Nicholas Kerensky, meanwhile, admitted to nothing because above all, he was concerned with his own survival at this point. He refused to tell his father what he had done and how he had manipulated his brother and taken advantage of the situation. I find those are the qualifications of a goddamn coward. But I digress. The fleet took the news of the attempted mutiny and the following reprisals rather hard. This, when compounded with the already negative morale within the Exodus fleet, resulted in an acute crisis of faith. This is because most people in the fleet could, on some level, understand why the mutiny happened. This was all beyond any reasonable time frame they could have ever conceived, as day by day they were jumping further and further off the damn map, deep into the unknown, and when somebody wanted to turn back for what seemed reasonable cause, the effect was brutal reprisal. That's not to say General Alexander Kerensky had shaky reasoning in this case. After all, any vessel that went back would inevitably give away the SLDF's position, or worse, add their firepower to what was undoubtedly an exceptionally unstable inner sphere. Additionally, the breakdown of morale in any fleet jeopardizes its well-being and cohesion. Still, not many shared Alexander Kerensky's convictions. Long journeys into the unknown do strange things to the human soul. General Alexander Kerensky realized the gravity of the situation and that his sheer will wouldn't hold people together forever. He realized that hope was the surest medicine for these seemingly hopeless times, and so in the aftermath of the mutiny, he issued General Order 137 on the 5th of November, 2785. The combined address and military order laid the grounds for why they could not go back, and that they must instead task themselves with building a better future. At the core of what would later be called the Hidden Hope Doctrine lays the following passage. Return to the inner sphere is impossible for us. Our heritage 
and our convictions are different from those we left behind. The greed of the five great houses and the council lords is a disease that can only be burned away by the passing of decades, even centuries. And though the fighting may seem to slow or even cease, it will erupt again as long as there are powerful men to covet one another's wealth. We shall live apart, conserving all the good of the Star League and ridding ourselves of the bad, so that when we return, and return we shall, our shining moral character will be as much our shield as our battle mechs and fighters. The words were chosen carefully to remind people that this was their choice to prevent the greater potential damage to the inner sphere by staying. He reminded them that by their sacrifice, through committing to this exodus, to renewing their pledges to a noble cause, they were preserving in some small way the Star League, what it stood for. And by such noble conduct, they would distinguish themselves forever from the savages they left behind. With this order transmitted to the fleet, there was finally the establishment of something concrete. A foundation of belief was laid out using simple language that all could understand, no longer merely running from the inner sphere. They were going to build something new, something better. The reception to the order was everything General Kerensky could have hoped for, for the SLDF quickly took it to heart. It stood as a reminder of who they were and why they'd made this choice. For the weary fleet, it also provided necessary direction, and through that, it renewed their purpose. Privately, General Kerensky was wise enough in the domain of the human spirit to know full well that words were not enough in the long term, that sooner or later, the exodus had to come to an end. By 2786, tensions were again beginning to rise. People had faith enough, but it was being sorely tested. By this time, they had been gone from the inner sphere for nearly two long years. Two years of endless jumping, of painstakingly covering their tracks, crammed into ships not designed for patrols this long, let alone extended deployment off the edge of the damn map. On the 24th of August, 2786, the fleet happened upon a godsend. Finally, after all their journey, far from the inner sphere, they found five worlds that were reasonably habitable. Finally, they had worlds of their own, and on these worlds, they would begin anew. Little did they know the trouble that would follow, for they had brought their ruination with them. General Alexander Kerensky announced to the fleet that they had finally reached their destination, that the long journey was over, and that the time to build was at hand. Soon after, the colonization of what would become the Pentagon Cluster began in earnest. While untamed and by inner sphere standards marginal worlds at best, the Pentagon Cluster was ideal for colonization and exploitation for many reasons. The worlds were near perfect distance from each other for combined defense, trade, and resource sharing. As an added strategic bonus, they were shrouded from the inner sphere by the Caliban Nebula, located just a few jumps away. Not that the Inner Sphere was intent on sending ships out this far to search for them. At 1300 light years from Terra, they were now far beyond where any man had gone before. And with colonization achieved, with renewed purpose, and with the hope of a new beginning, the peace they had sought for so very long finally looked possible. For nearly a decade, everything went well enough. From 2786 to 2794, there was a time of explosive development, of rapid expansion, and for many, finally, opportunities for healing. General Alexander Kerensky oversaw the creation of Star League in Exile, a provisional government designed to keep the dream alive, even if 1300 light years coreward of the inner sphere. It was a time of such prosperity that colonization efforts were soon enough directed to other worlds, namely the nearby stars of what was soon called the Kerensky Cluster. But it was not long before such prosperity would be challenged.
please, Captain, whatever you do, if you kill me, at least don't tell Stella. I don't want her to be at my funeral. He stares at him, and he takes a long pull on a cigar, and he punches him like 12 times in the face. <laughs> a country fuck that you. fuck you doesn't fuck exist you. fred please fuck belgium you. doesn't even exist maintain some decorum fred please
After thoroughly surveying the worlds and making as certain as possible they were suitable for permanent colonization, the SLDA fleet began to rapidly shift from survival in space to a dedicated colonization effort. It was a fundamental change in mission parameters, so unused equipment, weapons and warships were placed into storage or mothballs for later use if necessary. Few thought they'd need to touch a weapon in the near future, and for some, the conversion from a military life to a civilian one wasn't exactly a smooth transition. The SLDF found themselves in a case of turning swords into plowshares, and much formerly military equipment was immediately pressed into service in the name of survival, or cannibalized for parts to keep people alive. However, there was the ever-present issue of manpower. After all, a colony in a delicate balance of survival doesn't need a hundred divisions of fighting men and women. Colonies need civilian infrastructure. They were in need of hard work, sweat and determination focused on making a go at it, and so a fundamental change in the order of things was absolutely necessary for Star League in Exile to survive at all. Star League in Exile began to force the majority of the SLDF to test out and become civilians. The control demobilization required every member of the SLDF test or be forced out. Only the best of the best would stay in uniform, and the rest would become the genesis of a new civilian working class. 75% of the SLDF tested out, from the lowest ranking soldier to the highest ranking general. Only those of extraordinary aptitude, skill, and health were allowed to stay in uniform. The now unneeded vast arsenals of weaponry were placed into stockpiles called Brian Caches, playing homage to Star League's own Castle's Brian. Warships were placed into reserve fleets or mothballed around planetary bodies in the event they'd ever be needed in the future. Parts of the fleet lived on, and many of the demobilized SLDF served in a newly established group called the Explorers Corps, who began to chart nearby star systems for habitable worlds and exploitable resources. While the demobilizations were necessary for survival, it seems in retrospect optimistic or at the very least hopeful to believe for such a massive change overnight to succeed. Many of these brave men and women had seen decades of horrific combat, all of them deeply bearing the scars of their campaigns in some way or another, with most unable to forget the horrors of classed worlds and burning cities. Turning most of them into civilians, forcing them to change their lifestyle overnight was a gamble. While some adapted well enough, many had long ago forgotten how to be civilians or, in some cases, even civil. People who had suffered through campaign after campaign hardly felt rewarded for being told to now farm and like it. A new life forced upon them, and then with a complete lack of basic amenities, let alone any form of luxury, set the stage for future discontent. For a time, though, the SLDF took to their new lives without much complaint. It was, after all, a welcome reprieve from years of cramped starship living, wandering the cosmos aimlessly, and the horrors of their now distant past. Kerensky closed the book on the past as best he could, by broadcasting toward the inner sphere a final message. The voice of Kerensky broadcast we covered in the Ameris Civil War lecture series, but it is absolutely worth bringing up again for historical reference as a companion to the Hidden Hope Doctrine. The voice of Kerensky message was one of hope, conveying that perhaps one day the inner sphere would not be a place of turmoil, and that future generations may learn to live among each other in peace. Broadcast September the 9th, 2786, the voice of Kerensky message would take at least a thousand years to reach the inner sphere on broadband carrier waves. It was a message of hope, but prudent enough to be sent the slowest means possible. It would be time enough for people to grow up, time enough for people to find a better way. In theory, anyways. By strange coincidence, that very message would only be heard 260 short years later, but that's a whole nother story. For a short time, though, there was indeed peace and prosperity for Star League in exile. Cities were built, houses became homes, people farmed started families and did their best to forget their troubles 
and folks did their best to start over. In 2800, things began to change. Perhaps it was the age of their leader, as Alexander Kerensky was by this time a hundred years old and straining even the life expectancy afforded by the very best in advanced Star League medical knowledge. He'd not had by any standards an easy life, and with many long decades of stress, pain and loss wearing down on him, he was struggling to hold a dream together with zero room for error. He was weighed down by his most recent and perhaps deepest sorrow. As just four years earlier, his wife Katyusha had contracted a virus, grown ill, and died. This, when coupled with his advanced age, meant he was unable to tend to Star League in exile with his former vigor. The depressed ancient general couldn't hold the reins of power with the strength he once did, and certainly didn't trust his sons to assume those responsibilities for him. And so, slowly, things began to fall apart. At least that is one interpretation of events. I'm going to give you a different reason for what happened next. Two words. Capellan fuckery. Let me elaborate. I see the genesis of the problem as that once peace had taken root and people began to muster out of Star League, they had not only cast away their uniforms, but a military mindset without the discipline of a daily regimen, commands to be obeyed, and consequences for disobeying them. Order starts to break down, and a disorderly former SLDF soldier was probably at this point in time the most dangerous thing in the goddamn galaxy. There's also another overlooked benefit of a uniform, as it is a reminder of which side you're on. When you're in uniform and following a cause, as the SLDF had up to this point, it didn't matter where you were from or what you thought. So much as what you were fighting for, in uniform it's easier to overlook the shortcomings of your brothers and sisters in arms because they're part of the same mission as you are. You're looking out for them and they you. The situation may suck, but so long as you're in it together, everyone stands to benefit. It is further worth noting that by design, the SLDF was a multinational, multicultural fighting force for the benefit of the entire Star League, so that not a single house nor personal allegiance was allowed to interfere with the dedication of duty to the state above all. In the Star League uniform, you were fighting for the men and women at your side under the flag you carried and nothing else really mattered. But with Ameris long dead, Star League long gone, and now with nothing to do but try to start a new life, people had to define, perhaps for the very first time, what mattered to them most. People being people, falling back on old ways was easiest. And soon old loyalties and a re-emergence of successor state ideologies began to take root. Before long, relative prosperity and expansionism itself began to drive a wedge between various factions all eagerly attempting to exploit the same limited resources. And there's something most of you should know by now. Never trust a Capellan, because their favorite sheath for any blade they have is your back. On a jungle world now named Eden, small scale clashes. Skirmishes and disorderly riots broke out between colonists of the Federated Sons and the Capellan Confederation. People had by now fallen in line with ideologies, carried from the inner sphere, and banded together to fight those of opposing loyalties. People were initially content to riot and skirmish for a time as old enemies decided to finally hash things out sadly mirroring events in the inner sphere unfolding simultaneously. It can be said that old hatreds die hard, while lawlessness was initially suppressed by those few SLDFs still in uniform and what modest resources they still had available. They couldn't be everywhere at once. And so, in 2801, open rebellion had broken out. Rebel forces, nearly all of them Capellan, decided to declare independence from Star League in exile in May of that year. They were not merely content to say, we quit, we're out, thanks for the ride and the colony and keeping us alive, General Kerensky. No, 
They were intent on making a new state from the ground up and curb stomping anyone who got in their way. To further this strategic aim, they seized mothballed weapons and equipment from the tremendous arsenals they'd built years earlier to arm their new state and began fighting their neighbors, folks loyal to the Federated Sons, with everything at their disposal. Being that most of the population was quite familiar with how to effectively wage warfare, these rebels were not your weekend warriors playing games. With the SLDF being a bare handful of soldiers at this point, peacekeeping efforts soon failed, and the situation rapidly spiraled out of control. Few thought that soldiers who had sacrificed so much would eagerly betray their fellows for territory, resources, and loot, but Capellans will ruin anything, as is their custom. Maybe it was the sirens blaring, or people losing their shit, or just that familiar sense of chaos needing desperate leadership, but the rebellion broke Alexander Kerensky's torpor, pushed back the fog, and brought him back to the front. Yes, 101-year-old General Alexander Kerensky had had enough of this nonsense, and he acted to put an end to this. He dispatched his most loyal SLDF troops, led by his right hand from the Ameris Civil War, General Aaron de Chevalier, and backed him up with Major Elizabeth Hazen of Black Watch fame. The objective was to stop the rebellion from spreading, to preserve Star League in exile, and as necessary, destroy all opposition to good order. They were sent to put an end to this senseless violence and prevent further chaos from spreading in its wake. Eden was a dense, mostly untamed tropical jungle and filled with plenty of spaces to stage an ambush. Capellan forces had dug in deep and prepared the battlefield for the coming onslaught. When the loyalist SLDF forces made landfall, they found that the situation was worse than they were led to believe. Capellans had already done what they do best, which is lay traps and prepare to kill their former allies. As the SLDF forces approached the rebel encampments, Major Hazen's mech fell into a particularly devilish trap, a giant pit of oil that touched off the instant the mech fell in. That's not to say Major Hazen had grown soft, mind you, because Capellans have a PhD in backstab, betrayal, and traps like this. But with no way out and the mech rendered combat ineffective, Major Hazen ejected. Capellans being Capellans, they opened fire on the ejecting mech warrior with everything they had. Major Elizabeth Hazen, SLDF legend, Black Watch hero, and survivor of the Ameris Civil War, took a heavy caliber slug to the neuro helmet, mid ejection, and was out of the fight. For a few minutes. Yes, the Black Watch is that hard to kill. Being shot in the head is a minor fucking inconvenience. When she awoke, head ringing and angry as all hell, she found General de Chevalier heavily engaged in close combat with the rebels. I have not touched on the brave madness of General Aaron de Chevalier, one of the most loyal men Kerensky could have ever have hoped for. This was a man, after all, who years earlier was willing to wage war on all of the great houses to restore Star League. The short version of his career is thus. He was born in the Federated Sons, a survivor of the War of Davion succession, an elite academy grad, an SLDF hero, and a veteran of the 320th Dragoon Regiment, which was later tragically annihilated during the Hegemony Campaign. He was a fierce competitor and in his youth had placed in the Martial Olympiad of 2736. He was a graduate of the Elite Gunslinger program, the same program that bred the Black Watch Elite Training Regiment. He led the heaviest fighting in the Third Hidden War. He'd hunted pirates. He made it to Lieutenant General before he even met Kerensky and rose to Division Commander before the Ameris Civil War even began. He was known as being a fearless, ceaseless motivator who tirelessly stood his post, worked as hard as he could, and never gave up. The man had a reputation for being fearless in the face of impossible odds as he demonstrated by using the sharp pointy stick of the SLDF Navy to raid Ameris while Kerensky curbs stomped the periphery in Ameris' own Rimworld's Republic. He also knew what it meant to sacrifice for the greater good. Of his five children, two were killed by Stefan Ameris as they tried to find and protect members of House Cameron. His two oldest children died during Operation Chieftain, both having served as SLDF veterans and both having laid down their lives to try to take the hegemony back from Ameris. De Chevalier did not shirk from duty. 
or responsibility. So when the general said, make rebels go away, he waded in without second thought. So Major Hazen wakes up from a mild case of bullet to the narrow helmet to see an old Star League general with near seven decades of military service stomping into the fray in his atlas. Maybe it was past his bedtime, or maybe he was tired of this nonsense, or maybe he just wanted peace for once. But De Chevalier was thoroughly unamused by this compelling bullshit and set himself to take care of this problem at point-blank range. And fatefully for him, that is what the Capellans had been waiting for. As he waited in, as some would say to shield the ambushed SLDF units and buy time for a regroup, the rebels struck with full force. Using the full weight of their infantry, well-placed artillery, and sheer numbers, they overwhelmed the Atlas. De Chevalier didn't eject because to stop fighting and retreat would only endanger his men. He gave his last orders. He stayed at his controls and he went down swinging. They destroyed one leg, they disabled his mech, and he continued to fight like a madman. He was bellowing orders and firing every functional weapon he had, trying to hold back the jaws of defeat with every ounce of his soul. But no man is immortal. With wave after wave of Inferno missiles tearing into the Atlas, General de Chevalier died in a blaze of glory. And some would say that is the turning point. There was no way back now. A good man killed for no good reason. The uprising, the Ameris Civil War, and now the Exodus had, up to this point, claimed plenty of folks under similar circumstances. During the Ameris Civil War, entire worlds were glassed, put to the nuclear torch for no reason other than it denied Kerensky a staging point. Entire populations had been enslaved, starved, and gassed to prove Ameris wasn't going to go gently. Total war does that to a population. It relegates the act of killing to an industrial scale. And yet, with that war long over, and the trials past, with the hard times now behind them, Somehow, the worst of the Inner Sphere had been carried with them on the Exodus to this new frontier and manifested again to wreak havoc. The once mighty men and women of the SLDF were now turning their guns on each other and fighting with the same ferocity they'd used on Ameris. What happened next is only rumored as rebels didn't get a chance to really write much of a record of that event. And why that is, I'll get to presently. For with Hazen's fury unleashed, what had been a battle would now be remembered as a massacre. Major Elizabeth Hazen was thoroughly tired of this nonsense. She'd seen too many die. She'd seen too many fall in the line of duty. And this single death had stoked a flame deep in her heart. And this final act of betrayal was a catalyst for her rage. Sources say she emerged from the jungle in fury and grief and most assuredly about to kick some ass. Perhaps bagpipes played in her distant memory, perhaps with enough comrades lost along the way, the Black Watch officer had just finally snapped. What is known is she picked up a sword from a dead Capellan rebel and charged, and she just started cutting people apart. Any Capellan she saw died. Any who ran died tired. Any who begged for mercy found there was none to be had, at least not on this day. Her mad charge on foot with blood in her eyes and sword in her hand, with furious rage guiding it, proceeded to tear through Capellan lines. This insane act of defiance, a mad charge into overwhelming numbers to avenge the fallen, rallied the SLDF, because watching a Black Watch commander wading into a furious gun battle with just a sword, screaming bloody vengeance was just the sort of thing to spark their spirit. So they joined her. An absolute carnage followed. No rebels survived that battle, or the next one, or the one after that. Hazen didn't just turn the tide of a battle. She went on to annihilate every Capellan rebel she could find on the planet and found vengeance on any who dared to stand in her way. Eden's population fell that day, and that particular rebellion was made extinct. But the much-diminished SLDF couldn't be everywhere at once. 
The news of General de Chevalier's death and the chaos which followed emboldened the rebel factions and soon there was a full-on civil war. Faction after faction seized the moment and declared independence. It was absolute chaos as neighbor turned on neighbor, faction on faction, armed with the sheer volume of weaponry the Exodus fleet had carried from the inner sphere. Everyone had realized without a unifying SLDF, without a unifying cause, they were out for themselves and joining one of the many emerging factions was the only way to stay alive. Star League in Exile was now dead, a casualty of desperate people resorting to what they felt was their best option at that point in time. And, sadly, there was to be one more casualty. The death of his friend, his ally, his confidant, General de Chevalier, hit Alexander Kerensky hard. He was in the planning stages on striking back at the rebels, but sadly, on the 8th of June, 2801, he died of a massive heart attack. The worst of the inner sphere had been carried with him on the exodus, and then in a moment of strife, manifested among colonies they had founded, and there would be no going back to the brief peace they had achieved. SLDF veterans, at least those who'd not been forced to muster out, those who had only known and chose to maintain a soldier's life, were for the first time truly leaderless. The Star League in exile was now gone, reduced to a series of factions closely mirroring their inner sphere counterparts. Each faction vying for supremacy were now all too eager to wield the vast arsenals they had stockpiled, and through them began to forge new states for themselves. SLDF commanders in the field either fell in with the factions or died trying to put them down. In what would soon become the Exodus Civil War, in essence a microcosm of the First Succession War, the surviving SLDF leadership remained paralyzed. Each of the remaining generals tried to assert their own claims to Kerensky's legacy or began siding with one faction or another. But Nicholas Kerensky had his own ambitions. Perhaps it was a result of having lived in his father's shadow all of these years. Perhaps it was watching his father's noble dream die before him. Perhaps it was the cycles of grief and loss he'd seen in the course of his life. His father. His mother. Star League. Star League in exile. All were gone now. But there's another consideration for what he did next. I feel his previous illness had something to do with it. Nicholas had caught the same brain fever his mother had. A disease that wreaked havoc on the early colonization efforts and known to cause extensive brain damage in its victims. He'd fought it for two weeks on the verge of death, and yet he'd survived. And I feel that changed him. In the wake of his father's death, Nicholas Kerensky claimed leadership of the SLDF. He didn't see himself as a son of a great man any longer. He saw himself as the heir of a noble ideology, a legacy that could in time save them all. The SLDF and all it represented would be his. He would keep the dream alive. It wasn't the craziest thing to claim. After all, that's inner sphere standard operations. New boss inherits the job of the old boss. And Nicholas Kerensky saw himself now as a great man. That now was his time. His destiny was laid before him. Most of the division commanders decided to take their chances anywhere else. Most of them had no interest in following the unproven son of Alexander Kerensky in any capacity. Those who didn't laugh in his face politely walked away from his notions of grandeur. You have to try to understand their reasoning. Nicholas Kerensky had not fought as they had in the Amera Civil War. He knew nothing of command, of war outside of history books. He was merely the son of the great General Alexander Kerensky. The great general was now dead. From their perspective, his noble dream of a Star League in exile had died with him. Many of the veteran commanders of the Amer Civil War were dead or ancient or fully intent on carving what territory they could as warlords and wrecking their neighbors in the process. With as many weapons, warships, and supplies as they had, there was now no course but war. So why not fight it out? They saw their best option as to throw in with an existing faction and do their best to survive. It was the Inner Sphere way, after all. Joining the son, the presumed heir of a great leader, and trusting his ability to restore order was a leap of faith that few were willing to take at this point. After all, the last leap of faith they'd taken resulted in what promised to be a gruesome conflict and all the ruin that it entailed. But that's not to say General Kerensky's sons were alone. Despite everything up to this point and the hopelessness of the situation, some still believed. 
fanatically. So Nicholas Kerensky gathered those most loyal to him, or if not him, his father's cause, which he had now assumed as his own. He told them that the Pentagon worlds were now doomed, and that they must commit to a second exodus, to leave all of the factions behind, to leave the poison of the inner sphere's politics behind and start a new society. I ask myself, what kind of people would be willing to walk away from that? To take one last jump to follow the son of a great leader in pursuit of an ideology not quite clearly defined. Well, people who are dreamers for one. Nicholas Kerensky may not have been the ideal man for the job at hand, but perhaps the only man remaining with any semblance of a vision. Enough of them did see him as the inheritor of his father's dream. Nicholas, in turn, went to every Pentagon world and made his objective known. He wanted to escape the violence of what was now being called the Exodus Civil War and to carry the true legacy of Star League onward. He wanted to leave the cycles of tragedy and violence the Inner Sphere had always known. From the Pentagon Cluster, a bare few thousand volunteers joined him, and with what resources they could take, they jumped. They landed on a recently colonized world in the nearby Kerensky Cluster. In Russian, it means dream country. To his credit, Nicholas Kerensky later came back to save as many as he could. It was January 2802, Major General Nicholas Kerensky, yes, he'd given himself that accolade, Major General began using the assembled remnants of the SLDF Navy and carefully organized a exfiltration from the Pentagon Civil War of over a quarter of the surviving civilian population to this new world, adding to his meager resources nearly a million farmers, merchants, and workers. Further, his forces were bolstered by the majority of the Navy having opted to side with him rather than duke it out with capital-scale weapons over what amounted to a handful of planets and the so-called leaders who were now fighting for dominion over them. However, of the mech jocks, aerospace pilots, infantry, and tankers of the SLDF Exodus forces, only the 146th and 149th divisions fully sided with him in his dream. From his new vantage point, Nicholas saw the cycles of history were inescapable. Humanity in its current state would endure only occasional peace before solving things the old way. Good old-fashioned warfare vis-a-vis -vis grade A war crimes. He realized that the SLDF had left the inner sphere only to burn new worlds in the name of whatever cause they could drum up. He saw old ways of thinking, inner sphere ways of thinking to be toxic and a direct contributor to what was now unfolding knew that in time, this second exodus could very well do the same unless drastic action was taken. This new world had every potential to become a messy battleground in time, unless, unless he were to change everything. He saw that changes were absolutely necessary to prevent a future world from burning what he intended to make drastic changes, and not just what a society stood for, but the very fabric of society itself. What if he were to change the balance of a society, its aim, governance, and focus? The old ways to him were flawed as they gave into biases, beliefs, and allegiances, which inevitably resulted in mutual annihilation, and he saw himself as a great man the father of a new nation, guided by righteous ideologies given to him by his father. He was precisely the individual to forge a new civilization to correct the flaws of the old. And so, in the name of his father's legacy and in his own avowed belief in the nobility of Star League as an ideology, he reshaped the world from the top down. He saw himself as prime architect of this new world, and this would be a new society, free of cultural bias, of prejudice, of backward belief systems, and any allegiance to the old ways, or as he saw them, backward thinking. Nicholas envisaged a new society founded principally on meritocracy, not the inherited power dynasties of the inner sphere, but it would be a divisive society, by the warrior elite, the best, the bravest, and brightest that they had. Being a bit of a madman, perhaps as a result of his earlier mental trauma, serious illness, or just zealous belief in his own wisdom, 
He borrowed ideas from history that fit his vision for a utopian society. Upon closer examinations, it would be clear that he'd taken policies and governance designs from various powerful factions of ancient Terran history, from the Mongol hordes to honor-bound shogunate-era Japan and even the strict totalitarianism of the 20th century Chinese state. Using these ideas, he created a template for a brave new world, one which would hopefully allow for the old ways of the inner sphere to be finally buried. He'd split his chosen people into 20 organized units which he soon called clans. For each of them, he would choose a totem he felt represented a facet of their identity. They went along with this as, after all they had lost, they were united in one thing principally at this point, faith, and wearing the mantle of his father's legacy, he would shape that faith into what followed. At the heart of each clan was a reinforced mech warrior battalion of 40 warriors. Of the thousands and thousands of troops who had joined his exodus, he rigorously tested each warrior on their abilities to allow only the very best to continue to bear arms. This was to be a meritocracy after all, and a warrior society to boot, for in his eyes none were nobler than a warrior bearing arms to defend the society they led. He felt the army structure of the SLDF was deeply tainted and did away with lances, with standard military organization and hierarchies. He dreamed up a new way to fight, a new way to wage war, far from the perceived barbarism of inner sphere practices. The new clan organization was fairly simple, using schoolyard rules of arithmetic. Five mech warriors made a star, two stars a binary, four binaries a cluster, several clusters to a galaxy. Rank structures were similarly reformed. There was to be in theory at least no more militaristic glorification of the individual, no grand reward for being an exceptional individual save for being tested again and again in order to attain a higher level of responsibility and tests further to ensure you were worthy of keeping that position. Only the very best would do for his ruling elite regardless of their life up to that point. Only the ability to excel on the field of combat was important for what would become a warrior caste. Yes, Nicholas Kerensky was intent on saving the society of the inner sphere by imposing a caste system. The warrior caste would be a ruling elite made of the sharpest minds, the strongest bodies, and the most exceptional talents in the conduct of war, set against each other in continual trials. To allow only the strongest to endure would form a society of seemingly peerless combatants. I will say that admirably enough, Nicholas Kerensky submitted to these rigorous trials himself and excelled enough that by June of 2815, he had declared himself Il Khan, supreme leader of the clans. At least, that's what their history says. A history I must note again, that he had a hand in writing. Now, with 20 clans of 40 warriors each, initially that covers 800 individuals. They were, as the ancient Terran saying goes, the cream of the crop. This warrior class was the end result of generations of horrific warfare, and they were as hardened as humanity could provide. And while a ruling warrior elite was established, the question arose, what about the rest? There were a million civilians wondering what the hell they'd just gotten themselves into, fleeing from devastation and thankful to at least be alive. They were willing to put up with some changes, but Nicholas Kerensky had plans for them as well. Other castes would soon follow, but he had more pressing issues at the moment. Survival, chief among them. So by 2821, 19 years and change after the second exodus, and four short years after establishing himself as supreme ruler of this new warrior society, he decided that it was finally time to fix the issue of the worlds he'd fled. The Pentagon worlds would be the first major trial for his new society. To gain resources, to save face his father's legacy, and prove the legitimacy of not only his leadership, but of the society he'd engineered, he wanted to take back the Pentagon worlds, reclaim the entire forces of the Exodus, and impose this new society upon them. This plan became known as Operation Klondike, and it was a terrifying success. 
namely because the extensive preparation, intelligence gathering, and endless battle drill of Nicholas Kerensky's forces, the fighting forces of these new clans had drilled, fought, and competed against each other endlessly in war games, war games that were at times bloody contests between combatants over who was the ultimate warrior that day. For years, endlessly, they had drilled, testing themselves against each other in every possible manner. With every trial undertaken, they were preparing for a full test of their abilities on the fields of battle to come. As Nicholas Kerensky's forces exhaustively prepared themselves for conquest, the Pentagon worlds had waged war among themselves over what dwindling resources remained in the name of whatever heathen cause they could dream up. The Exodus Civil War continued in a brutal fashion, unchecked or unchallenged. In the wake of the Second Exodus, the survivors of the Pentagon worlds had battled each other without major pause for 20 years. After ferocious conflict, they had generally mismanaged their own situation to the point they were about to collapse. They fought each other with the same relentless ferocity currently unfolding in the inner sphere, acting in many ways to mirror the First Succession War in all but scale. Every weapon at their disposal was being used to the fullest of its capabilities. The veterans of the SLDF had fallen into old habits, and using the skills they developed during the Ameris Civil War, they'd nearly burned each other to cinders to fight for marginally habitable space. Kerensky had up-to-date intelligence on the exact condition of each Pentagon world from refugees and from traders now plying the space lanes, and his own vast naval forces reactivated for the invasion itself. Five separate fleets were sent out, one for each Pentagon world. They would observe and report the situation in detail. Reconnaissance was conducted in phases, and from listening posts clandestinely placed in system, all colony activity was recorded in detail and broadcast back to Ilkhan Nicholas Kerensky. The clanners plotted the location of all colonial vessels, all spacecraft both active and derelict. All communications and their content was thoroughly analyzed to get a better read on the situation. Slowly, through passive signals intelligence and direct observation, fleets got an exact picture of what was happening. And most importantly, where to strike. Battle planning was exceptionally thorough. Each of the five Pentagon worlds would have four clans assigned to invade and hold them. The invasion itself was the first clan Blitzkrieg, and in essence a true test of Nicholas Kerensky's new society. This operation would showcase what they had learned, as well as the leadership, vision, and wisdom of Nicholas Kerensky. They had cast off the old ways, choosing to devote themselves to the legacy of Kerensky and the dream of a better world. But would it help them here and now? It is worth noting that at this point the survivors of the Exodus Civil War piloted barely functional equipment. And while the scale of the Exodus Civil War may have been small, considering it was a small population to start with, it is worth weighing that, with the sheer amount of combat experience common throughout the population contained within the Exodus, coupled with the disproportionately immense amount of firepower at their disposal, the casualty numbers were accordingly horrific. The Exodus Civil War had destroyed roughly half the population and reduced the former colonies to total ruin. That's not to say Nicholas Kerensky's conquest of these worlds went without significant effort or casualties. The stakes were high, his numbers were limited, but this was an ultimate test of an ideology, and if they failed, their belief system would be proven insufficient, and no doubt the survivors of that would, in again, in fashion, turn on each other. If they succeeded, however, they would forge a stronger society than they had ever enjoyed since leaving the inner sphere. The outcome of this invasion would also shape planner history in other ways, as stated, it would demonstrate that the new way of organization and thinking trumped the old ways, which had, as demonstrated, significantly weakened their enemies. Secondly, the clans who did well in proving themselves through the invasion would be in positions of significant strength to bargain for additional territories, new worlds in the Kerensky cluster, or additional resources from what they captured. But those clans who'd suffered during the invasion or failed to completely accomplish their objectives would be left weakened, and weakness was not something the new world would allow. While the invasion and liberation of the Pentagon worlds was overwhelmingly a tactical success and a further masterstroke of planning and preparation, it was during this time that the clans would suffer a significant loss. Andre Kerensky died on the 1st of December 2821 in an ambush, alone. 
He stood against a reinforced lance and while he gave a good showing, he was slain by repeated deliberate shots to his cockpit. With his death, one of the few people who could have shaped the clans in any meaningful way, or at least served as counterbalance to the doings of his brother Nicholas was now dead. Some would suggest that Nicholas arranged the ambush to be rid of his brother so that he and he alone could steer the clans. The truth of that is some matter of dispute. It is of historical note, however, that one of the greatest lasting influences on clanner society would be a matter of linguistics. To this day, clanners say F instead of affirmative and neg instead of negative. This was a habit of Andres from his youth, something he'd passed on and clanners still keep alive. Post-subjugation, the civilians that were liberated by these elite warriors were at first thankful for the fighting to be over. They were impressed by the leadership and display of firepower, and they were further grateful that the clanners hunted down the most savage and cruel warlords of the Exodus Civil War and brought them to swift, if brutal, justice. As a curious observation, it is worth noting that the people he liberated hailed Nicholas as his father, as he bore a striking physical resemblance to the great man. Then again, Nicholas had tried to emulate his father in many ways, not leastwise his appearance, as he piloted an Atlas II where his father had originally led from the front in an Atlas in the early stages of the Ameris Civil War. But it is no great surprise that people mistook him for his father. It had been near 20 years of horrific genocidal conflict that had muddied people's perception of history. All they knew was Kerensky was central to all of this. A Kerensky had led them out here, now a Kerensky was saving them. In light of their liberation and being saved from ruin, they saw Nicholas as the fabled savior Kerensky. And rather than correct these people's misconceptions, he chose to say nothing. Perhaps this fed his ego, or he truly saw himself as an inheritor of his father's greatness, ideology, and power. Passing out food and supplies, bringing law and order, and mostly a new way of life away from what these people had suffered, he slowly managed, in effect, to become the salvation these people so desperately needed. What follows next feeds into that, I believe. Unlike many conquerors throughout history, Nicholas Kerensky had planned for this moment. One of his first acts was to admonish the people, giving them his father's General Order 137 again. Some of them had forgotten about that in the intervening years of warfare. As education took a back seat to the needs of basic survival, he offered them the words of his father as more than a historical article of importance though, but more as an article of faith. Nicholas Kerensky didn't just read his father's general order, he applied it to their current situation as one might a parable or guiding piece of philosophy. He preached to the people, interpreting his father's general order as a prophet might signs from heaven. He told them to grow and mature and to act in every way to eliminate the greed within them that had driven them to this path of destruction. He gave the people his father's words as gospel and offered through them a path to salvation. He offered them a road of honor, a belief system, a path that could transcend the misery they had inherited if they tried hard enough. He promised them a future they could take ownership of, and that one day, when all was well, as his father had dreamed, they could return to the inner sphere and restore the peace of Star League once and for all. And that was something they could believe, after everything they had endured and all of their suffering, it was what they felt was the wisest course of action. This unifying gospel of Kerensky, this renewed belief in their purpose and a new way of life would give meaning to them. And why not? After all, Kerensky was their savior at this point. But first they had to tear away the last vestiges of the old world, the old ways. Any remnants of the corrupting, destructive inner sphere ideologies had to be left behind if they were to move forward. By Nicholas's interpretation of his father's wisdom, inherited from father to son, they quickly destroyed all that remained of the old world in any meaningful references to it. They filled their minds with devotion to personal and by extension clan growth. Nicholas Kerensky took the concentrated remnants of the Exodus Civil War and scattered them among the Pentagon worlds so as to never again allow people to congregate along political or cultural lines. And the people obeyed. They were traumatized by the Ameri-Civil War. 
the Exodus, the Exodus Civil War, and were by now tired of suffering. People's resistance had been completely beat down to a point that they were willing and ready to accept anything that promised a potentially happier tomorrow. Kerensky began shaping his new society as their leader and prophet of his father's wisdom and communicated his directive often as much through extensive writings and directives. His process was to take the written and recorded words of wisdom from his father and draw from them unique interpretations which would then be applied to this new civilization. For example, General Alexander Kerensky's SLDF Primer, 12 Principles of Command, is more or less the foundational blueprint for the clan's internal bidding process for combat war trials and testing. General Order 137, as interpreted by Nicholas Kerensky, is the basis for the clan justice system. His shaping of society didn't stop there. Over time, he became not only a preacher for his father's vision, but a prophet of its wisdom. From the writings, orders, wishes, and publications of General Alexander Kerensky, his son Nicholas wove the tapestry of a new society. The changes to this new world would become increasingly radical as the last vestiges of the inner sphere were swept away into the dustbin of history. And where precisely those choices would invariably lead is something we'll have to get to next time on part two of this lecture series. So for now, class is dismissed, and we will close the book on the clans for now and pick up next time, next lecture. Remember that this will be on the test, and for the love of God, stay away from the clown on the station. He's not haha -ha funny. He's more a Pagliacci on bath salts. Your puny cadets are no match for elemental clan warriors. Ah, fuck! Shirekan, we are the first one to be able to get the first one to the 半径25マイル以内で私たちに正当な敬意を払わなかった者たちはその家族やペットも含め全て始末しました警備員は境界線上で待機し戦争計画を妨害しようとする暗殺者スパイまたは愚か者を破壊する準備ができたあれこの音楽はとないだ WBPL76 WBPL76 presents Community Service Theatre Duncan Fisher in William Shakespeare's Macbeth. That's right. Thanks to the court settlement, we have Duncan Fisher as Macbeth. And I do mean that literally. He's every role. Yes. Hello, everybody. This is Duncan Fisher. I'm doing Macbeth. Sure. Let's pick it up where I left off. Methought I heard a voice cry. Sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep. Sleep, sleep that sleep that knits up the raveled sleeve of care, the death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds, great nature's second course, <laughs> chief nourisher in life's feast. Speaking of, if you want a feast in life, you want to order MacPale. Fits and in, in fi Fits into any mech cockpit, then holds as much food as you can eat. And boy, is there a lot of it. It's just chock full of vitamins and things. Now with less chalk, mech pale from the makers of Bag of Glass and Box of Farts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fucking sweet. I ate that shit. 
Reminds me of this one time where I was in the Valhalla Club getting totally tanked. And this guy came in That's and he not just... the end of the plate. You can't go off script. Eh? This is only Act 2. What? Act 2? Jesus Christ, how long is this piece of shit? It's a tale told by an idiot. Wait, wait. Don't I get to stab anybody else? Oh, this thing's boring as hell. All the cool shit happens off screen. Who wrote this anyway? William Shakespeare, Jesus Christ, just stick to the script. I cast Fireball! Oh God, why is this happening? Hey, Discount Dan here, and let me tell you about my new business. Discount Dan's Pretty Above Board House of Boggins. Why'd I call it Discount Dan's Pretty Above Board House of Boggins? Because if you call it Discount Dan's Big Old Pile of Rusted Broken Shit, nobody shows up. Nobody. Not even the people looking for the mountain of cocaine that surely doesn't exist under the pile. Or does it? I don't know, but I'm passing the savings on to you. Let me tell you what I got in this pile. I got all sorts of things that I bulldozed out of the Steiner Arena. All sorts of things. Mech parts, mech seats, mech decals, mech rust, genuine mech rust. And it's all sold by the pound. By the pound! Can you imagine what you might find? This is genuine grade D scrap that may or may not contain the barely conscious remains of mech warriors too stupid to eject, but don't take my word for it. I found a needle with my foot. I need a doctor. There's this guy dragging himself out of the pile. The discount Dan just dragged him back and said, Not so fast, fucko. I think he needs to go to the hospital. I found this really cool boot, but there's a foot in it. There was a really cool piece of metal that said Clan Snake Cobra, and you know, Discount Dan helped me put it in my truck. Then he drove away in my truck, and I kinda want it back. Look at those fine, satisfied customer testimonials that I didn't record without their knowledge. Good job, people, for saying words with your mouth holes. Speaking of mouth holes, boy do I have some greasy porn straight from Canopus. I fight my enemies because that's what I'm paid to do. Never hesitate to act or even think it through. I retire any day, but I spend too much on guns and horse. I ain't gonna drop no more. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, I just hope I can get by. Glory, glory, I just wish they'd pay me more. I guess I'll drop once more. The people that we're fighting are capellans through and through. I asked for reinforcements, but they said that would be you. I'll wait for them to eat themselves, that's what I'm praying for. I ain't gonna drop no more. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, I just hope I can get by. Glory, glory, I just wish they'd pay me more. I guess I'll drop once more My actuator's broken and my left arm's gun is jammed The other day I saw them turn my best friend into ham For dinner I shall eat some pills that I found on the floor I might not drop once more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I just hope I can get by Glory, glory, I just wish they'd pay me more I guess I'll drop once more I got all kinds of upgrades and my mech is fully bling I like to fire my cannon just to hear my own ears ring Every single mission, I swear it's my blast big score But I know that'll drop some more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I just hope I can get by Glory, glory, I just wish they'd pay me more I guess I'll drop once more My family is buried and my home world is ablaze I do not see the irony as one more town I raise I've lost sight of all revenge and speed, lust and the oaths I swore I just wanna drop some more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I am blessed to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war Let's all just drop once more The client didn't tell us what we would be fighting for And all I know for certain is I will not die from poor In other words, I'm just another fucking dog of war I'll gladly drop once more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I'm just lucky to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war 
Sometimes I'll just drop once more Never trust Capellans or anything they say They'll always stab you in the back just to get their way The only thing that's worse is their shit substandard pay I guess I'll drop once more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I just hope I can get by Glory, glory, I just wish they'd pay me more Let's all go drop once more I fought my way through 49 and even 52 With no fucks given, you'd be surprised by what you can do And when the shit has hit the fan, you know who will fight your war Just pay me to drop some more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I'm just lucky to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war Let's all go drop once more I've murdered filthy pirates and a few capellans too I've stomped on goddamn clanners and survived to tell it true If there's one thing that I'm counting on, it's never been bored I'll gladly drop once more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I'm just lucky to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war Let's all just drop once more I've been paid in every coin that's ever known to man I'll fight for any reason because that's frankly who I am Plausible deniability is what you pay me for Fuck you, pay me more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I'm just lucky to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war Let's all just drop once more When you're a mercenary, there are seldom lasting rules Those who choose to live by them will often die as fools War crimes may just happen unless you choose to pay me more I'll always drop some more what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I'm just lucky to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war Let's all just drop once more I've raised some noble houses, companies, and even schools I'll mortar fucking orphanages with the latest of the tools I'll raise entire cities because that's what I'm best known for Pay me to drop some more what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I'm just lucky to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war Let's all just drop once more I am a problem solver, I just use some different tools From AC-10s to LRMs and anything that's cool I'll shoot your enemies and charge you by the fucking war Send me to drop once more what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I'm lucky to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war Let's all just drop once more From Solaris to Dekayan, I have seen a thing or two And across my vast career, I know there's one thing that is true It ain't required to know just what the hell you're fighting for I'm just gonna drop once more Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die Glory, glory, I'm just lucky to be alive Glory, glory, let's all fight another war Let's all just drop once more What in the cinnamon toast fuck is going on?